You learned a little bit about comparing two categorical variables when we talked about contingency tables. You talked a little bit about um, graphing two quantitative variables when we've created scatter plots. Now we're going to do uh, a brief lesson on comparing two quantitative variables. So in order to really look at the relationship between two quantitative variables, beyond calculating the correlation coefficient, which just really measures the strength of a relationship, we're going to figure out how we can model that relationship using a line. So modeling really is just fitting um, a generalized function to a set of data. So when we, we want to fit a line to our data to better describe the relationship between the two variables so that we might be able to make some predictions. So remember a scatter plot. So a scatter plot is the graph of an explanatory variable versus a response variable. So the variable that we think will change based on changes in the explanatory variable. In this case, we have fat responding to changes in protein. And remember, each of the points in a scatter plot represents one subject or experimental unit. And so from every subject, we gathered two pieces of information in this case protein level and fat level. And if we want to talk about the shape of our scatter plot, remember that was form, strength, and direction. In this case, the form, we talk about whether it's linear or not. This one appears to be approximately linear in shape. The strength, it seems to be moderately strong. The points are fairly well gathered together along that line, so we'll say moderately strong. We'd be able to say more about the strength if we calculated the correlation coefficient. And the direction, which in this case is positive. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about a line that might fit this data by discussing residuals. So when we fit a line. I'm just going to put a line on here pretty arbitrarily. Okay, so let's say we think this line generally fits our data. We think that's the shape that our data overall is taking. We can see how good of a job our line is doing at making predictions because the points on the line are the predictions. And the points that are the plotted points are our data. So what a residual is, is it's the difference between a data point and a predicted point for, so, and for a specific x value. So let's, for example, if I want to figure out what the residual is for this point right here, I'm going to look at the x coordinate and I'm going to draw a vertical line to the predicted value. Okay, so I'm here. The length of this distance is called the residual. Okay, or one way to think about it is it's the actual minus the predicted value. And in statistics, the actual value is represented by the variable, and the predicted value is represented by the variable with a hat on it. So we actually call that y hat. Okay, so if I find the difference between y and y hat, I can find the residual. So least squares regression, or well, I guess you can't really see this, let's see. So least squares re regression, or the line of best fit, is a specific line that makes the sum of the squared residuals as small as possible. So this, remember when we were doing standard deviation, we would square the distances. This is very similar, right? A residual is a distance. Um, so, and we're squaring them. And the reason, part of the reason we did that in standard deviation is very similar to the reason we do it here. I'm going to have positive residuals where my actual value is above the predicted value, but I'm also going to have negative residuals like this one where my actual value is below the predicted value. So if I just sum, sum all those up and average them, the positives will cancel out the negatives. So just by squaring them, I can take all of these negative values and make them positive. So when I average them together, I will get um, a, a number other than zero. And it also will draw attention to the points that are further away from the predicted line. 
So this isn't something that we need to, we don't need to go through each of these points and calculate a residual and try to minimize those. But the line of the least squares line, when you do that calculation using a computer or a calculator, will is doing that for you. So here we're going to look at the general format of a least squares line or a regression line. And remember, you're going to be using a computer or a calculator to calculate these values for you. But know that the sum of the squared residuals, remember these are the residuals, is minimized with a least squares line. So you're trying to minimize all of these residual differences with the line. So the general form of a least squares line is y hat, remember that's your predicted y, equals b sub 0, which is really just your y-intercept, plus b sub 1, which is your slope, times your x value. So in this case, x is protein and y is fat. So this should remind you a lot of the old y equals mx plus b, right? So m is slope, b is y-intercept, so this shouldn't be all that new. So after running this data through a computer program, we find out that the least squares line is this one right here. Okay, so what we know is that when we try to predict fat from protein, that the y-intercept is 6.8 and the slope is 0.97. So how do you describe that? For slope, that what you're saying is for every one unit increase in x, so as x increases by 1, y is predicted to increase or decrease, depending on the scatter plot, by whatever the slope is. So that's generally how you'll describe slope all the time. So for this specific problem, we know our slope is 0.97. So what we would say is that for every one gram increase in protein, so I'm just filling in the blank here, protein is my x, gram is my unit, y, so y is fat, fat is predicted to, in this case, it's increase by 0.97 grams. Okay, so this, you can think of this as a fill-in-the-blank statement. All right. And then what do we get to say about y-intercept? Y-intercept isn't wildly interesting, right? The y-intercept is where your x value is zero. So really all we can say is when protein is zero, fat is 6.8 grams. So it's really your starting point for fat. It's not that interesting um, most often to talk about. Um, but occasionally it finds a meaning. So we can use our equation once we get it. Remember the equation that we came up with was fat hat, sounds bizarre, okay, fat hat equals 6.8 plus 0.97 times protein. So we can use that equation to start to make some predictions. So there are two types of predictions that we can make. We can do a prediction using interpolation, that's predicting a value that is within the range of our data. So in this case, it's anything in within the data points that we've been given. So it looks to here between 0 and 50. So if we try to make a prediction between 0 and 50, then we're doing interpolation. So for example, Let's say I want to make a prediction about what's happening at, um, I don't know, approximately here. I guess that might be 45 grams. So notice, I don't have an actual point, okay? So I want to make a prediction there. So in order to do that, I'm just going to plug in my value, fat hat equals 6.8 plus 0.97 times 45, okay? And then just you simplify the side and you get your predicted fat content to be 50.45. Just make sure you remember that is a predicted fat value. So you're predicting that at 45 grams of protein, there will be 50.45 grams of fat.
Okay, so we can also make predictions that are outside of our range of data. So let's take a look at where that might be. So notice, I don't have any data that's way out here, maybe at, um, let's say, at 60, oops, maybe at 60 grams. So if I want to make a prediction outside of our range of data, Then I'm going to do the same set of steps. I'm going to take fat hat equation, and I'm just going to plug in the value that I want, 6.8 plus 0.97 times 60. And when we do that, we get 65 grams. So we predict that when protein is 60 grams, that fat will be 65 grams. And we can kind of see that on our, over here. That makes sense when we actually look at this on our graph. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about making these predictions. So we can feel pretty good at, it, at making predictions using interpolation because we have some data that, that we've been given to support this line where it is. But outside of our data, we're really not sure if um, our if we were to collect data at much larger values, if we'd really be able, if our pattern's still going to persist. So is my pattern going to persist at 60 grams of protein? Is my pattern going to per persist at 100 grams of protein? We don't know. So we want to be very careful about extrapolation. We want to be more and more cautious the further we are outside of our range of data. So it doesn't mean we can't make predictions, okay? And if we have a really strong relationship, I think we can feel even better about making predictions. But because we don't know what's going to happen further out, because we don't have the data for it, we, want, we just want to make sure that we're being cautious. So predictions very far outside of our range of data are risky. Okay, one last thing about making predictions with our, with our equation, we can't make them backwards. So this equation that we have written here only predicts fat. Okay, in your math classes, I know you learned to plug in for this value, fat value maybe, and you solve backwards to get protein. That's not going to work in statistics. So this equation is specially created in order to minimize these vertical residuals. Okay, so we can't use it backwards. We can only use this to predict fat. If we wanted to make a prediction about protein, we would have to flip our X and Ys and rerun our, um, our software in, or, you know, in Excel or our calculator in order to get a new function that would predict protein. And it will be different. It's not necessarily going to be the inverse of this one. So we get a new function to predict protein and we would have to use that one. So please don't ever use this equation to predict in reverse. It's only used to predict fat hat.